Uh, let me now introduce Brett Meadows. Uh, Brett has spent 25 years in the semiconductor world, starting his career with Micron Technology as a uh, DRAM design engineer. He has worked for Ford Microelectronics, Ramtron, United Memories, and VLSI Microsystems, and has designed ASIC de devices including engine control modules, vehicle multiplex control devices, implantable cardiac pacemakers, and memory devices including DRAM and non-volatile ferroelectric RAM. With that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a, a, a scheme we developed for uh, uh, protecting against hardware supply, supply chain attacks on DRAM. Uh, the focus of this is really on uh, row hammer and cold boot attack. Uh, these are uh, uh, attacks that keep raising their heads in the industry. They, they become very uh, uh, um, uh, prevalent, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. Then I'm going to talk about our proposed mitigation. And uh, with that, I want to start talking about the, the use of DRAM. As uh, I think Gabriel mentioned earlier, we he was talking about uh, uh, computers being so ubiquitous in uh, uh, in use. Well, DRAM is uh, associated with every computing device out there, including cell phones, computers, IoT devices, and evolving AI processors. Uh, as as the memory walls collapse on AI pro processors, uh, more and more memory is going to be used needed. Um, this makes DRAM a perfect uh, uh, target for hardware-based crypto, crypto analytic attacks. Uh, with that said, we're going to focus on on the row hammer and cold boot. Uh, each of these, uh, from from a cold boot standpoint, we're going to be looking at confidential confidentiality issue, and uh, uh, row hammer is more of an integrity issue. Uh, within this work, we propose an on-chip technique, which uses on -chip, uh, an on-chip key register, which obfuscates the memory addresses and data and provides fast detect response to defend against these hardware-based attacks. Um, I do want to note that uh, there are similar techniques that are done off-chip, but the, the novelty of our uh, approach is doing on-chip. I do also want to note that uh, through our uh, implementation, we we effectively implement a self-healing uh, function, uh, and we'll talk about that more later. I also want to note that, uh, and I think this was mentioned earlier in a presentation, that uh, using hardware is very, um, or hardware-based attacks, hardware vulnerabilities rather, are very costly to defend against. Uh, that's why it, you would really like to uh, implement changes early on in the uh, cycle, development cycle. Uh, if you if you get a piece of silicon out and you have to go make a mass change, it can cost uh, uh, millions if you have to do the uh, entire mass set. So, with our with our technique, what we are going to do is mitigate row hammer and cold boot attacks using a scam scrambled. Uh, address and data schema, uh, which uh, uses a static register containing a key. The key register on the chip is not accessible to the attacker. Uh, a, a, a method could be included, which would allow the key to be read out, but then uh, that would effectively be backdoor, which uh, probably not advisable. Uh, a quick key purge option, or a quick key purge upon power down erases the key in approximately three nanoseconds. Uh, now that's for the the schema I'm going to display here in a moment. Um, of course, this is going to uh, uh, going to be technology dependent and design dependent. Uh, we do not rely on any uh, hardware or software uh, on the chip or external. Everything is uh, uh, implemented on chip for our our technique. We've. Uh, Upon power generation, uh, power up generates a new uh, scramble, which that actually is what generates the self healing behavior. So, uh, 
it, it's interesting because uh, Alex Halderman uh, at Princeton uh, discovered this in 2009. Uh, I remember reading this paper and it, it was, uh, uh, having come from the DRAM world, it was, well, this, this isn't anything new. And then I realized uh, because this had been around, this, this technology uh, and this phenomenon had been around since uh, Robert Bernard discovered it in uh, 1960, late, late 60s, 67, 68, he, he was aware of the uh, cold uh, effect on DRAM, and uh, but it made me realize that in it went until 2009, after all those years, that this was found to be a vulnerability. I thought, you know, that's that's very interesting that it took that long. Um, but with that said, uh, Halderman uh, exercised this, and they investigated cooling it and actually uh, recreating perturbed keys that were stored in memory. Rohammer attack, uh, it has a similar uh, history. Uh, it, the interaction of cells, rows, and, and columns within the uh, DRAM are always, always um, uh, tested for. We know there are dependencies, but uh, it wasn't until 2014 that here again, that was really identified as a, a vulnerability. Uh, and and uh, Young-Gu uh, young Kim, from Carnegie Mellon uh, discovered this, and uh, but but he had to have a, a very many attack uh, or, or hammers on the row to to uh, execute the attack. I believe it was like 139,000 uh, activations on adjacent rows. So with that, I want to go into a brief uh, overview of the memory array. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, I'm going to use a cursor here to point. Uh, so it, Memory cells are comprised of a capacitor and a transistor. When the word line, I'm going to reference word line one here, when that turns on, you transfer charge from uh, node N1 over onto the bit line. Uh, and that's that bit line then takes that, that small charge and amplifies it through the synth down below here and uh, amplifies that voltage, which does two, two things. That, vo that voltage sent out as a data state to the outside world but it also refreshes the charge on this transit on this capacitor. So that that's basically the the uh, row hand, or the the cold boot attack is actually the RC decay of this transistor and other parasitic paths uh, become so large that this voltage on N1 or N2 uh, is uh, sustained for a longer time, which is undesirable as we really want a non-volatile device to be not, or a volatile device to be volatile, not uh, not being non-volatile for a, a short time even. Uh, with Rowhammer, uh, it, it leverages uh, capacitances and uh, um, parasitics within the array to couple different word lines to cells, as I'm depicting here on word line zero, acting to uh, activate or influence cell N2. Uh, I've depicted several different uh, uh, parasitics in this. Should be noted that these parasitics are very process dependent. Uh, you know, uh, depends on the DRAM technology and the DRAM design. So existing mitigations, there there are several of them, and I know some. Uh, there there was a paper, I think it was the best paper uh, award in the conference, has went to uh, uh, trespass, which uh, it talks about uh, target row refresh. So uh, I mentioned that down here, but all, all of these uh, uh, mitigation techniques, uh, some of them are more effective than others. And they all tend to uh, have some drawback to them, including power, uh, consume power, time it takes to uh, uh, alleviate the, the issue uh, area. Um, and they rely on off-chip circuitry and storage of encryption keys in some instances actually being stored in the DRAM, which is counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. Our proposed mitigation is to use a, a register on chip which scrambles addresses, row, uh, including row, column, and bank, 
and also scrambles the data. Uh, th this register is populated up on power up and uh, with a session key and up on power down that key is erased. Up on power, up on power down, the uh, uh, mitigation of cold boot is actually affected because uh, you've lost the correlation between data and address. Uh, upon power up, a new address scramble is created, and uh, that will also uh, uh, assist the uh, cold boot attack. But it also it, it's the primary mechanism in mitigating row hammer in that uh, the row information is once again scrambled. So in this next uh, chart, I have a a depiction of this register. We used 44 bits for this demonstration and that's really evolving out of a uh, 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 use of a 256 meg DRAM uh, 4 gig DRAM rather 256 by it's configured as a 256 meg by 16 16 IOs so with that configuration we use 15 row address bits uh, 10 column address bits and three bank address bits So I'm depicting a key D here operating on 16 uh, uh, data bits. Key C operating on uh, the column address bits. Key R operating on row address bits. And key B operating on the bank address bits. So the total sum of those is 44 bits. There again, this is, a, this is an example. and. Uh, I, I say it's nominal for area because uh, this, this could conceivably be implemented in uh, the, the hardware, uh, the layout areas of the chip. Now, upon, as I noted before, we started out with a, uh, a zero a ground state in the all the bits. Upon power up, we're going to shift in a uh, random key. Uh, and that's going to be generated on trip chip. Now, I do want to point out that we are not looking at uh, um, the actual pseudo random number generator in this effort. All we are doing is uh, uh, shifting in a a, a key. Uh, that future a future research effort will look at integration of uh, on chip noise sources. There is a lot of research done in that, and we will leverage what's out there. Upon power down, the key gets erased, and that's resets to zero. So our scrambling, uh, I'm going to go back here a second, as uh, th this scrambling affects uh, our scramble, as I depicted here in the, in the right side of the diagram. Upon power down, we once again purge the address or the uh, key, and everything is reset. So the next time we're ready to power up, we uh, will get an, another random key. The register is actually comprised of this circuit. Uh, this is an example circuit, and I use this. Uh, I just want to do a quick, quick explanation because the uh, this is an example, and it it's a. Uh, it's imperative that this function correctly in a uh, power transitioning mode. Um, that's why I'm using in-channel devices as depicted here in M3 and uh, uh, M6, in which as the voltage comes down, I fire a reset signal, which will purge the data in this cell. This is really just two latches back to back, and it, there's two of these, there's one of these cells for each uh, register cell. Simulation of this is performed with uh, uh, taking four of those bits and loading each of those bits with four, with uh, high data. So all, all uh, 44 bits are taken high. 
at uh, I, I used a I, I, I developed a little uh, circuit to do this. It was basically a, a current mirror and uh, using a band gap reference and set the uh, voltage at one volt so that when I hit one volt upon powering down after having loaded all bits high, the reset signal fires and uh, approximately 2.3 nanoseconds later, uh, all bits are reset. So it's very fast. Um, that's in comparison to trying to write all memory cells in the DRAM to zero or to one, uh, just some defined state so as to uh, erase all memory content. Uh, that takes approximately four, four seconds. Uh, now this is an older technology, but it took approximately four seconds uh, to overwrite the DRAM. So there's a, a, a big difference between uh, being able to, to capture data uh, on the part of the attacker. Uh, 2.3 nanoseconds, very tiny window. Uh, four seconds, uh, uh, we just can't get rid of all the data in time. Uh, and I say that because uh, if you wanted to, you could possibly could include a bunch of capacitor on chip, make a battery, but uh, that's probably not feasible. The tools we used were Spice and Verilog. Um, we used LT Spice, uh, Icarus Verilog, and uh, Electric Linear Technology Spice is open source, um, and uh, Having come from the DRAM world, I can tell you these tools, the commercial tools are way expensive. Um, a sheet of uh, uh, Spice can cost $300,000. A sheet of uh, Verilog is very similar. And uh, uh, one of the uh, other uh, commercial vendors for uh, layout tools, uh, same thing. They're, they're just very expensive. I uh, did this uh, all open source to save money. So I want to talk a little bit about DRAM design considerations. Um, when, I, when I first started Micron years ago, uh, uh, one of the senior designers asked me, he says, what are the top, three top considerations of DRAM design? Uh, I don't know. He said, uh, number one is price per bit. Number two is price per bit. Number three is price per bit. Uh, it, it's kind of a joke, but in actuality, it really emphasizes the, the uh, cost sensitive nature of DRAM. Um, these are built in multi-billion dollar fabs, and yet they can sell for a dollar a piece. So uh, you got to be selling a lot of DRAM. That's why they're typically done, uh, created on very large wafers. Um, current nodes are, are down to uh, 10 nanometers, 10 uh, uh, technology nodes uh, being what the process is being created in. Um, Samsung just announced a uh, 10 nanometer using uh, extreme UV. Uh, other design considerations, we want to minimize cost, performance, impact, obviously. Uh, include mo logic modifications of locations, which minimize delay. Uh, placement is critical. Uh, I think the placement route tools can optimize now, but uh, you still have to be able to uh, indicate where you want to put these. Um, you want to minimize power consumption, and I'm going to talk about a trade-off on that in just a moment. Uh, power consumption is huge in, in DRAMs and is very, uh, uh, it's a huge consideration that is. Uh, there are integration issues with our, our approach and uh, how it can be used with uh, maybe other solutions. Uh, we implement a minimal chip area. Um, there again, that was the uh, nominal value I stated of 44 bits. Uh, if, if additional capability, uh, uh, resistance crypto crypto analytic attack is desired you could uh, make the key space bigger uh, some design trade-offs and uh, now this is kind of a, a an ironic point uh, longer cell retention time uh, mi minimizes power uh, if refresh accommodates that refresh time or that uh, RC delay time so in actuality you could be saving power with DRAMs in these big data centers if uh, you push the, the refresh uh, way out, 
right now, the spe specification for DRAM is 64 milliseconds. In other words, every cell on that chip has to be re re refreshed every 64 milliseconds in order to maintain uh, data integrity in, in the given data states. Um, uh, uh, but a quick per a quick key, <coughs> pardon me, a quick key purge allows for long cell RC decay, but effectively makes the device a a volatile device, uh, which also leaves the point that this could actually be used on uh, non volatile memory, uh, because I'm sure there are instances where you actually would like to uh, erase that non volatile memory if uh, in the event uh, you don't want to be there anymore. You don't want, you don't want the data to uh, reside on chip anymore. So from a functional integration standpoint, um, DRAMs have redundant cells, including uh, uh, those associated with rows and columns. Those cells are uh, brought into the uh, uh, array and, and configured after the uh, ch uh, chip is produced and goes through testing. These processes are very complex and you don't get 100% yield on all bits in the array, uh, thus the need for redundancy. Now, in order to uh, facilitate uh, that capability, our schema would need to uh, also be uh, enabled after uh, redund redundancy is configured. Key generation and entropy uh, is, is always a consideration. Uh, one possibility is implementing this, uh, the register as a linear feedback shift register, uh, which would increase uh, uh, statistical properties. Uh, under layout considerations, uh, we can possibly use uh, on-chip power detect circuit, uh, as many, many devices already have that. So the idea would be to utilize what, uh, um, circuits are already available, already residing on the chip. Uh, they may need some modification, but uh, uh, it, it would be ideal not to add additional area and increase cost. From a resilience standpoint, um, we're using minimal logic and physical geometries. Uh, so we, we, we're trying to minimize impact and potential failures and probability of failure. Uh, we, we have any dependency on other part of the computer, the, the, the system. We function uh, uh, totally independently or can function out totally independently. Uh, we have small fo footprint that can uh, uh, go up, though, there again, if you want to increase uh, 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 key space. Uh, the recovery mechanism is session based and does not require significant complexity. Uh, and advantages to our, our methodology, uh, on-chip key generation and storage are not externally accessible. Uh, session keys stored in static flash, not in memory. Uh, DRAMs can, uh, depending on dielectrics that are used, they can uh, suffer from uh, uh, charging which and, and uh, getting a preferred state. Uh, dendritic growth through the dielectric can affect it. Uh, address and data scramble with different key for each session. Uh, th this also mitigates uh, preferred states um, because you, you're always, um, well, you're potentially writing new data or the same data to a new location uh, when you power up. Does not rely on any external processing, uh, hardware, software. It's compatible with most external processing. I put this uh, in there as most external processing because if anybody is trying to uh, uh, do this externally. Uh, if, if there's a targeted row refresh kind of capability that's being done externally, uh, this would interfere with that. Uh, it, it could work with target row refresh on the chip. Uh, has minimal die in area impact, uh, but that depends there again on the uh, desired key size. Uh, that, that could actually be some research to uh, define a uh, price per bit of security on, on a DRAM. Once the key is purged, the correlation of data state and associated uh, location lost. For ch challenges and in future investigations, uh, we require uh, uh, this to be done before the chip is created. Um, this got to be done as part of the 
the design process. Uh, retrofitting is not an option. Uh, well, it could be, but it could be very expensive. Uh, there again, mass sets are very expensive, uh, millions of dollars. Uh, it does require ch chip area for larger key space, so uh, it, there could be some uh, uh, methodologies which uh, enable some code um, generation of uh, uh, or encoding of information uh, to, to make it more effective. We could prevent uh, mitigation included in the memory controller, as I previously stated. Um, if if uh, somebody's implemented a target row refresh like capability. On chip key storage with quick purge capability enables data and address scrambling. Um, we, we believe this is feasible. It, uh, it can work. Uh, it would require integration at, at design time and it would require a lot of simulation. And uh, the register cell itself would be a critical design element. But it can mitigate cold boot attack, row hammer attack, and preferred states in memory cells. And with that, I will conclude and thank you all for attending. And I'll hand it back over to Michael. Great, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> we have just a couple of moments for QA. I've got uh, several questions in the chat window, so you might be interested in staying on, <clears throat> excuse me, and answering some of those. Um, uh, yourself. Let me ask a couple of these questions. Would the would the solution here be extended to uh, warm boot? Essentially, the the magic that Windows 10 does to bring everything back, even when I try to restart it. I, it could be, uh, but I you know it really depends on. I, I'm not sure what Windows 10 is doing to RAM, uh, but it, it certainly could. Uh, there there could be another hook put in there to the uh, reset signal. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, even to the point that uh, if somebody wanted to remove the chip out of a system after cooling it down, uh, you could actually put enough capacitors on on chip. And that's one of the, the, the uh, nice things about having such a small circuit uh, to actually uh, remove that key, even though the car, the key, the, the chip has been removed from the system. Okay. Uh, would a would a similar approach uh, be something that could be brought up to scale on more complex logic uh, through boot time key uh, driven randomization uh, and other examples? Um, I I believe so, but I I can't say I know enough about some of these boot sequences. No, no, but I, I, I believe there are, there are hooks that can be brought in. Kind of uh, one of these last questions. Careful of, I'm sorry. Oh no! I, careful of is to uh, uh, there again. If you're going to put a sensor on the chip, uh, just be cognizant of the space it's going to take. Okay. And so uh, another question is: Is the key static while the system is powered on, and could I now run a row hammer attack uh, that will show the map of the uh, uh, the bit flips of this key space? Yeah, that, that's a great question because, um, yeah, uh, so typical row hammer, uh, people can go in and uh, basically brute for force and figure out what's where. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, use cases in which people do not want uh, the, the DRAM characterized for that kind of behavior um, so that, uh, so that the, the, the part is delivered in a uh, in a known state, if you will. So that's where the supply chain uh, side of things comes into play. Preventing people from, uh, uh, if you will, uh, fingerprinting or uh, qualifying the part uh, or characterizing the part before delivery. OK. And there's there's a bit more conversation going on in the chat, but let me ask one more uh, one one closing question. What's the DRAM die penalty uh, to implement this? It was very small. I actually have that in the paper. Uh, uh, now I was using a 180 nanometer, which is about a 20 year old process. Other uh, again because it was open source, uh, but it, it was it was very small. 
but there again, that's going to depend on the layout uh, that, that's performed. Uh, I, I am not a layout designer. I was a, a circuit designer. And uh, if you got somebody skilled in it, uh, you know, they, they can probably do a phenomenal job in, in reducing area. Um, and uh, I was reading an article the other day that Google says, uh, you know, that they have an AI engine that can now do this. And, uh, and uh, you know, that, that, that would be optimum, actually. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Brett, for your for your presentation. Thank you, Michael. Todd. And um, we will... thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Um, and I'll I'll take the time to thank all of our presenters, all, everybody who um, uh, proposed papers for this session and for uh, the workshop during the day. Uh, I believe it is now my privilege to introduce our uh, closing keynote. Unless Natalie corrects me in the chat. <laughs> Ready to go? OK. Um, so again, thank you all for attending, for staying with us, for being um, online all day and, and making this a more interactive uh, session, which I think uh, uh, most, if not all of us, have enjoyed very much. Um, Zach, am I introducing you or am I introducing David Nickel? Or am I introducing you to introduce David Nickel? I, I believe you're introducing David. OK, well, then well, I saw your uh, handsome mug there and I wasn't sure. Um, and, and David, you'll have to correct me if I mispronounce this, but you are the Franklin W. Uh, Volke professor. Pretty close. Yeah. Say it again. No, that's fine. I, I think it's like voltage. Only oh. if you were German, you'd say voltage because you can't tell. <laughs> All right, professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he's also the director of the Institute, uh, sorry, the Information Trust Institute, the director of the Advanced Digital Sciences Center, and the director of the Critical Infrastructure Resiliency Institute. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Nick. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, um, uh, as I say, that, you know, the, 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 that's all, folks. Uh, it's been a great day. It's been really full. A lot of great things have, have uh, passed through here. Uh, we've seen talks about emerging technologies, some even more mature than emerging in software and hardware to detect manipulation of things in supply chain, to prevent manipulation of things in supply chain. Uh, great work has been done. There's lots more to be done. It's like a jobs program. Uh, in addition to the, to the technical problems, you know, there are, there are business problems, and there was some discussion of this, and, and I had, um, I warned my heart to see that because, you know, even though I'm a tech guy, for things to happen, you have to the decision makers to decide that they're going to do that. And those decision makers, they don't have PhDs, usually they have MBAs. And so they think differently and you have to talk to them differently and you have to address the problems the way that they, that they see them. And so, you know, a question for me anyway with supply chain stuff is who owns the problem? Who's responsible for it? It's, it's too big to, to depend on a company, which means that you're going to have to find incentives for people to invest in doing something about this, this supply chain. Now, there are carrot incentives and there are stick incentives, and soon talk about a stick incentive that's coming along, but, you know, there are incentives that, that change behavior. So we have to see that. But if you're going to be talking about business models, then uh, you're really talking about risk. And if you're talking about risk, that means you're talking about measuring something. There was some reference to challenges in measuring things. Uh, what should you measure? And what's the certainty in the things that you have measure? And are you measuring the right things? And uh, provenance is part of that as well. If you're going to be measuring something, it's, you know, what's the provenance of these things? And that's where the measurements are going to come. And that's where the risk is going to come from. And then what are the models that you use to do the, the sort of risk analysis? And so that's, I think, a, a big area uh, that I hope we see more of in, in, the, coming, in the coming years. Um, the government has known and had been working hard on, on this issues related to supply chain uh, for some time, as evidenced by the folks from the national labs who've been working on it and reported on some of the things that they're doing. Um, I would just point out that just it was just about a year ago, the Department of Energy put out a, a FAW uh, asking for um, responses to envision uh, an institute, a $70 million five-year institute, uh, to look at cybersecurity uh, for energy efficient manufacturing. $70 million is a lot of money. It's actually not a lot of money, but the, one, the important thing was that if you looked at that fall, and it did, 
there were two main thrusts, and one of those thrusts, technical thrusts, was supply chain. And so this is this is a big deal, and an announcement was just made this week. Uh, and so I expect that you know the the group that uh, won that is going to be working very hard, and going to have to be working very fast because the expectations are very high that they're going to be able to do something about this. Um, also, and and I think Zach made reference to this in his introductory remarks. Um, just in the last, it feels like a couple of weeks ago, maybe there was a, a executive order from the president's office that addresses supply chains and you know the practical impact of it is that the Department of Energy is now responsible for deciding what utilities are going to be able to buy and put in put in their power plants. Um, and it's about supply chains. And so it's really incumbent upon us all to give the Department of Energy the tools that they need to make good choices as they as they uh, assume this this responsibility so um i want to thank the folks at idaho national labs who did a great job in, in putting this together uh the names of people that i encountered in the course of this um charlene uh sample and natalie uh, summers and eleanor taylor and of course uh, the beaming Zach Taylor Woods tutor right there. And um, there may be somebody else that I, <laughs> my apologies if I, if I left you off, but um, it's been a great team to work with. And, and I think that uh, they have much to be proud of uh, in, in what we got together uh, in this day. And so uh, that's it, you know, show's over. Unless, no, wait, no, hang on, hang on. Zach has to have the last word. So Zach, have the last word. Well, you know, gee, thanks. And and as you mentioned those MBAs, I, I just took a moment to look up um, Weiss. So the workshop on economics of information security is uh, uh, supposed to be in Brussels uh, in 2020. I'm sure it uh, has a chance of being virtual, but um, you bring up a good point that those of us that are looking at supply chain and and uh, there were some questions about, um, you know, don't we need economical uh, responses, uh, but maybe the cheapest uh, option may not be the best. And so it could end up being more expensive. We should team up with some MBAs and uh, maybe workshops like this or some others are where we can actually do some of those interdisciplinary things that the larger um, single focus uh, you know, conferences won't accept until we make it a mainstream uh, type of uh, field of study. But uh, so work with some ec economists, find out how to get supply chain uh, incentives of both kinds in and get our technologies. And with that, you know, David, thank you so much. Thank everyone uh, that participated, our speakers, our panelists, uh, uh, all the people that, uh, that put this together. Uh, Gabriella, who um, did double duty, you know, run the conference, uh, you know, you know, serve the virtual meals, sit on the virtual panel. Um, so, uh, so great job by everyone. So, uh, so thank you all. And uh, I don't know if we uh, turn this over to Shar for the uh, the final final word, but if not, uh, have a great weekend, everyone.